Amen. All right. The title of the sermon this morning is Drink Offerings in the Bible. Drink Offerings in the Bible. Now, there were numerous or different, many different sacrifices that were offered you know, under the Old Testament or under the Old Covenant law. And many of which it seems like we and, and the majority of people know very little about. Obviously, the most dry portion of the Bible, the majority of people would refer to as all of the, you know, the, the specs of the law when it comes to the temple or the tabernacle at this time. And you get into Leviticus and it gets into all the washings and things like that. And, and the offerings and the sacrifices are a big part of that. Of The majority of people would say that's a very boring part of the Bible. That's a very dry part of of the Bible, but I'm going to be preaching to you about the drink offering this morning. And the majority of people, when they hear that, they think, man, that sounds like a very boring subject or very boring, you know, issue. Obviously, we need to try to make, you know, everything in the Bible interesting. You know, everything in the Bible is interesting when we study it out. And, and that's actually one of the things that caused me to want to go ahead and preach this sermon is because over time in studying the sacrifices, because I myself personally have, in, in, in any of the churches that I've t attended, I've never really been taught very well, I feel like, on you know, from the pulpit, that is, the sacrifices and how they actually operated, what was the procedure of them. So this morning's sermon, I think that you're going to find it very interesting, all the different aspects of the drink offering, number one. Uh, but number two, I want you to know that this is going to be a very exhaustive study on drink offerings in the Bible. When you walk out the door this morning, you're going to understand the drink offerings that much better, and you're also going to understand the sacrifices of the Old Testament, I'm sure, in a much deeper way way. As I said, many people have a very shallow understanding of, of the sacrifices, and I was guilty of this for a very long time, even when I would consider myself somewhat of a Bible student uh, in my life. But uh, we need to study all portions of the Bible, and the sacrifices are a very large portion of what is talked about in the Old Testament. Now, I want you to go to Genesis chapter number 35. Uh, slide your bulletin there in if you haven't dropped it already. In Exodus chapter number 29, the very first mention of drink offerings actually takes place before the Old <coughs> Covenant was ever given. Before the Old Testament uh, ever existed, we already saw people offering drink offerings. Offerings. This is not something that originated just right then, right there with the uh, Old Testament law or with the covenant when it was given to Moses. Drink offerings took place prior to that. So I want you to look with me at Genesis chapter number 35. <clears throat> we'll look at verse number 13 and 14. The Bible says in verse 13, and God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. This is speaking of Israel or Jacob, the man. Then it says in verse 14, And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, even a pillar of stone. And he poured a drink offering thereon. And he poured oil thereon. So I want you to notice all the way back to Genesis chapter number 35, the patriarch Jacob when he here speaks with the Lord, he sets up this, this pillar that's meant to be a memorial or a monument of this area of where he actually spoke with God. He had a conversation with the Lord. So he sets this up to remember it. But then he goes further than that and he offers a drink offering. or He pours the drink offering thereon on the pillar itself. And then he also pours oil thereon. And we're going to see both of these things taking place in the Old Covenant. So notice that this happened even previous to the law being given. Now the second mention is where you were just a moment ago. Exodus chapter number 29. So flip back to Exodus chapter number 29. And we're given quite a bit of information here in Exodus chapter number 29 on the drink offerings. And it kind of gives us a, a, a more full understand, standing I'm sorry, of the drink offerings. Now let me say this first before we get into it. There were many different times and days where they would offer sacrifices. Now I was going to say uh, ways and purposes but but this is kind of split you know, uh, in a couple of different ways, and I'll explain that to you. They had different days and events, as in they had, sometimes they had feasts, right? So they had different events or different days where they would offer these. One reason would be they had feasts that they would offer, drink offerings, sacrifices, all different types of sacrifices and offerings, right? 
You know, they had the Passover. They had, you know, the Feast of Weeks, right? They had numerous of these uh, that they would, uh, you know, come together. But then they also had the other types of offerings where they could just bring it any time. These were free will offerings. Uh, you know, these were the offerings of thanksgiving. And then you also had sin offerings that you as an individual could bring, like a trespass offering. So they have all these different types of offerings. Some of them took place on certain days for feasts or for events like that. But then the other times they would take place in the event of maybe you sinned, in the event of maybe you had a trespass or a vow or something like that. So there are different times and reasons why people would bring these offerings. And there were <coughs> also different types of offerings. And these are the basic types of offerings. There is the animal sacrifice or the animal offering. There is the meat offering. Now, meat is not referring to like what we refer to as meat today. The Bible calls that flesh. When it says meat offering, it's referring to things that are made of flour. It's referring to things that are made of dough. It's referring to breads and cakes is what it's called. That is the meat offering that they would bring. So they had the animal sacrifice, the animal offering that they would offer. They also then had the meat offering, which would be like a bread or a cake that they would offer. And on that, they would pour oil on it, right, for cooking purposes and different things, seasons and things like that. But then they also had a drink offering. Those are the three types of actual offerings that they would give. Now, they would give those offerings in the event or on those certain days that I just mentioned. So, and then they also, in addition to that, had the continual or the daily offering offering that they would do, which is what we read about here in Exodus chapter number 29. That would take place in the morning and then it would also take place in the evening. So this is the basics of how the sacrifices or the offerings took place. And what we have here in Exodus chapter number 29 is the first real rundown of how the sacrifices work and the offerings work. And you have the drink offering being mentioned here as well. I want you to look with me at Exodus chapter number 29. We're going to begin in verse number 38. <coughs> verse number 38, the Bible says, Now this is that which thou shalt offer upon the altar, two lambs of the first year, day by day, continually. So this is the daily offering, morning and evening. The one lamb thou shalt offer in the morning, and the other lamb thou shalt offer at even. And with the one lamb, verse 40, a tenth deal of flour mingled with the fourth part of of an hen of beaten oil, and the fourth part of an hen of wine for a drink offering. Now I want to stop you right there. I want to point out the word with. I want you to notice that this is the morning and the evening offering. Now oftentimes when people think of the offering that was offered in the morning and the evening, what do you think of? What portion of sacrifice do you think of? You think of the lamb that was burnt. But every time that that lamb was burnt, every single time that that lamb was taken in there, in the morning offering, the daily offering, this takes place continually, and the evening offering, they sacrificed that lamb, but with that, it was, it was mandatory that they also offered two other things. Notice verse 40. And with the one lamb, a tenth deal of flour mingled, that means mixed, with the fourth part of a hen of beaten oil. So the oil goes in and is mixed into the flour. This would be like a bread or a cake that we would think of. But then on top of that, it says this. With the fourth part of a hen of beaten oil and and the fourth part of a hen of wine for a drink offering. So in addition to the bread and the wine, or I'm sorry, the bread and the oil being mixed and mingled together, also something else that is offered with the lamb, it tells us, is the fourth part. So one fourth of a hen, that's a form of measurement, and hen of wine for a drink offering. So you may have overlooked this, but the daily or the continual offering was not just the, the sacrifice being burnt, the lamb being burnt. That is not all that it was. The lamb was taken, but with that, every time, every day, they also offered the meat offering, which was the flour like we read about there. And the oil was mixed in or mingled with the flour. And then in addition to that, they had the drink offering that was offered continually daily. And in that situation, it was a quarter of, one-fourth of, and hen of wine. That was a, the drink offering. Look at verse number 41. It says, And the other lamb thou shalt offer at even, and shalt do thereto according to the meat offering of the morning, and according to the drink offering thereof. And then it tells you, For a sweet savor, an offering 
<coughs> made by fire unto the Lord. So notice all three of these things are offered together. The lamb, the meat offering, and the drink offering. And it's also, all three of them are offered in the fire. Every last one of them, they're offered in the fire. That's why you're able to smell it. It's a sweet savor unto the Lord because it's burning, right? It's in the flame. I want you to turn with me now to, to Numbers. Actually, let's go to Leviticus first. Leviticus chapter number 23. So we see that they're always offered together. We can see that there in Exodus chapter number 29. We're going to look at Leviticus chapter number 23. We're going to look at the majority, almost every single mention of the drink offering when it comes to the procedure. The only times we're not going to look at a drink offering being offered, it's very few other in uh, instances in the Bible. It's going to be situations like this. The book of Numbers has, in the very beginning of the dedication of the altar and the dedication of the tabernacle, certain things that they were required to bring. You know, the lamb, the drink offering, and the, me the meat offering were offered in order to dedicate the tabernacle in order to dedicate uh, uh, the temple and things like that when they did that later on. Those are pretty much the only instances that we're going to skip. We're going to look at all of them and it's not just ex you know, uh, an exorbitant amount but it's quite a few so we'll have a very thorough understanding. Look here at Leviticus chapter number 23 verse number 9. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye be come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. So it's talking about how they were to offer the first fruits. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow, after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And you shall offer that day when you wave the sheaf and he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. And the meat offering, watch this, thereof. Notice that wording, that, there, that there's automatically just considered a meat offering that goes with it. The meat offering thereof, keep watching, shall be two tenth deals of fine flour mingled with oil. Exactly the same of which we read before. An offering made by fire unto the Lord for a sweet savor. And then it says this, and the drink offering thereof. Notice again, there's just automatically this drink offering that's offered every time that a sacrifice as far as a lamb is given. And the drink offering thereof shall be of wine, the fourth part <coughs> of and hen. So notice there that it gives us a, quite a bit of detail about how this is to be offered and it's perfectly in line with what we had read previously. Now we're going to skip, we're not going to read the rest of this just for sake of time, but if you'd like to later it just kind of goes over some of the more, the other uh, uh, specs of how it is to be offered with different lambs and different types of situations. But every time that there is a lamb that is offered, there is every single time. Without exception, there is a meat offering that is offered with it, and then there is a drink offering that is offered with it every single time. Now, there is the wave offering that we read about in Exodus chapter number 29. And what takes place with the wave offering is they kill it, they wave it, then they burn it on the altar. But every time that that lamb is brought to the altar, there is something that is offered with it. There is the meat offering that is offered with it, which is a portion of flour mingled or mixed with oil. But then there is also a drink offering that is offered with it as well. Now, you can, if you want to, on your own time, you could read down through verse number 18. It kind of gives you more of the information about that. So it's a collective offering of all three of these things being offered or sacrificed together. Now we're going to turn over to Numbers chapter number 28. Go over to Numbers chapter number 28. And we're going to spend the majority of our time here <clears throat> while we're studying this early in the sermon. Numbers chapter number 28. This is going to be more of the nuts and bolts of how this works. More of the, the, the specs and the specifics uh, here in the earlier portion of the sermon. And at the end we'll get to an application and things like that. Uh, but Numbers chapter number 28 we find more information than we find anywhere else. Look there at Numbers chapter number 28. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, <clears throat> And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel, and say unto them, My offering and my bread for my sacrifices by fire, for a sweet savor unto me, shall ye observe to offer unto me in their due season. So right now there he's just speaking in general about all of them, right? Look at verse number 3. And thou shalt say unto them, This is the offering made by fire which ye shall offer unto the Lord two lambs of the first year without spot day by day for a continual burnt offering. Verse 4, the one lamb shalt thou offer in the morning, and the other lamb shalt thou offer at even. So this is a parallel passage with what we read before, just to kind of give you some personal information about what we're reading. But we're given much more detail here. Look at verse number 5 now. <clears throat> 
Uh, verse number four, actually. The one lamb shalt thou offer in the morning, and the other lamb shalt thou offer at even. Now, verse five. And a tenth part of an ephah of flour for a meat offering mingled with the fourth part of an hen of beaten oil. So notice that that is involved again with that. Then look at verse number six. It is a continual burnt offering. Uh, it is a continual burnt offering thereof. Uh, I'm sorry, I lost my spot there. It is a continual burnt offering which was ordained in Mount Sinai for a sweet savor, a sacrifice made by fire unto the Lord. Verse 7, <clears throat> And the drink offering thereof shall be the fourth part of an hen for the one lamb. In the holy place shalt thou cause the strong wine to be poured unto the Lord for a drink offering. Now we're going to stop right here in verse number 7 because there's a ton that we can learn already. Now if you would have noticed in verse number uh, 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 9 in Leviticus 23 that I read there for just a moment, it used the wording, their drink offerings. Like they almost are possessive of that. And the reason why is because every single time that there is a sacrifice or an offering, there is a meat offering that is offered with it and there is a drink offering that is offered with it. Every time that there is a offering that is offered by fire or a burnt offering, and that is virtually every single offering. And not only that, here in verse, in, uh, uh, well, back into Exodus chapter number 28, if you remember, 29, it said every time that it mentioned the meat offering and the drink offering, it said the meat offering thereof. The drink offering thereof. It also said that it was offered with it each and every time. We see the same thing taking place here again in Numbers chapter number 28. We see it saying that it's offered with it. And it also says in verse number 7, it says, And the drink offering thereof. So notice that there's a drink offering thereof. It's already assumed because that's how all the offerings are offered. Even in verse number 1, the reason why I pointed that out actually at the end of verse number 2, it says, Ye observe to offer unto me in their due season. Then he gives you a rundown of the daily offering. Now, the way that the daily offering is offered is how all the other offerings and all the other uh, sacrifices are offered. When someone, if someone brings something that's just going to be a meat offering, it ends up being offered with a sacrifice as well each and every time that it's burnt on the altar. When there is a, an animal sacrifice of a bullock or a lamb or a ram, they always offer with it, like he's telling them, when you offer that, you also offer at the same time the meat offering and the drink offering. The purpose is to make sure that it has a sweet savor unto the Lord. The Bible talks about that he enjoys these smells. God in heaven has a personality and he likes certain smells. That's why he chose out if you think about the certain, you know, the, 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 the certain different uh, fragrances and the oils that have certain types of, of scents to them, right? He enjoys certain types of smells. And he says, hey, this is the ones that I like. And he says that that is a sweet savor unto the Lord. So they don't just burn the flesh. That never takes place in the Bible. What they do is they take the, the ram or the lamb or the bullock, the animal that they're offering, and then they offer a meat offering with oil. So that has a scent and a flavor to it. And then they also have a drink offering that they offer with it. So this is something that I believe is very much overlooked and not preached on and not explained very well. But... Every time there's a burnt offering, there's always a meat offering and a drink offering that's offered you know, uh, with it or thereof or however you'd like to word that. There in Numbers, I want you to also notice that it says that it is offered in the holy place. So notice that this takes place in the holy place. It takes place at the altar. Look at verse number 7. It says, <clears throat> in the holy place, there in the middle of the verse, in the holy place shalt thou cause the strong wine to be poured out or to be poured unto. So notice that when this offering takes place, it takes place at the altar. Right at the altar is where this takes place. The one that is in uh, the holy place, not the holiest of all or the most holy. That is where this takes place, in the holy place. When they you know, burn the burnt offering, when they offer this sacrifice, it takes place in the holy place. Not only that, a lot of people don't understand this. If you were to ask the majority of Christians, like, hey, what did they do with the drink offering? What did the priest do with the drink offering? I would say a lot of them would get it wrong. A lot of them would say that they consumed or that they drank of the drink offering. Let me make this extremely clear. You know, this is categorically, unequivocally, you can study it until you know, you're as weary as can possibly be. There, there is not a single verse in the entire Bible where they drank of the drink offering, ever. Not one time. It actually, and I'm going to show you a verse here in just a moment, where it's very, very clear that they did not. 
That it, that it actually explains that they did not, outside of the fact that it actually gives them clear instructions in what to do with it. And this is what they do with it. Look at verse number 7. It says, And the drink offering thereof shall be the fourth part of an hen for, for the one lamb. So notice it's for the one lamb. When the lamb's offered, the drink offering's offered. Then it says this, In the holy place shalt thou cause the strong wine to be poured unto the Lord for a drink offering. So what did they do with the drink offering? Did, they, did the priest go in there and start boozing it up and drinking? Because notice it says strong wine. Are they drinking it while they're eating? No, they're not. They're pouring it out unto the Lord. They offer the lamb. They put the meat offering there. And then obviously it's meant to be a sweet savor. So where do you think they pour it? Just into the fire? That doesn't make sense. They pour it all over the flesh. They pour it all over the meat offering that goes on top of it. So if you notice, it's building up. It tells you first the sacrifice is offered. That's the, the, the majority, that's the, 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 the central point. That's the pivotal point of the offering. The lamb, right? That's the main portion of the offering. Then beside it, there's a meat offering that's mingled with oil. Then you take, after you have both of those laid down and set down on the altar, they're burning. Then you take the drink offering, a fourth part of an hint of oil, and you pour it all over it. What's the purpose? For the scent, for the smell. It's meant to be a sweet savor unto the Lord. They don't just pour it out over here. They pour it on the fire. They pour it specifically on the fire. And that's why it says this. It says, In the holy place shalt thou cause the strong wine to be poured unto the Lord for a drink offering. <coughs> That is the only time that the phrase strong wine is found in the Bible at all. You can type it in, do a search. Strong wine, it's never found any other time. Now you, you have times in the Bible where God talks about, and we're going to look at this, where he's, it's, it's not mingled, it's not mixed, it's not watered down or things like that. But the phrase strong wine, this is the only time that it's used ever. Now when the drink offerings were offered... If you go to the book of Numbers, it one time mentions to you uh, the two different types of drink offerings that you can offer, and it tells you strong drink or wine. Now here we're told that that wine is strong wine, right? So we can see that the types that they're supposed to offer is an alcoholic beverage. That's very clear that it's a fermented beverage. And we know very clearly from this passage as well that they're not drinking of it. Of course, we're told, look not thou upon the wine when it is red. It's talking about don't drink of alcohol, right? And then it goes into the effects if you consume it. So it means don't drink of it. Not only that, there is a clear commandment that is given to the priests that if they drink in the holy place, God's going to kill them. So they're not drinking of this. And it's offered in the holy place. We know that without a shadow of a doubt. In addition to that, we're told that they poured it out. So they poured this drink offering on top of everything. And it is a strong wine. What does that mean? It has a, it has a high alcohol content. A very high alcohol content. Now if you pour just water on the fire, what's it going to do? It's going to douse it. That's the perfect word for the science, scientific word for it. It's going to put it out. That's what you, you know, water does to a, to a fire. It douses it. It puts it out, doesn't it? But if you take something that's a flammable liquid like alcohol and you take that and you, and you pour that on the fire, what's it going to do? It's going to just enrage it, isn't it? It's just going to just it's just going to cause it to just, you know, grow and to just become, you know, more, you know, uh, uh, fervent, isn't it? It's going to grow is what it's going to do. That's the purpose of the drink offering. So it, it it's dual purpose when it comes to the physical practical application. It's meant to savor it. Just like the oil being added and notice that every time when it says drink offering it says, it's a sweet savor unto the Lord. So you know what happened when you took that, that wine, or you took that strong wine, and you poured it on the, uh, you know, the offerings or the sacrifices thereof? It started to give off a smell, didn't it? And even today, chefs and, 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 and different restaurants and people that will, you know, are involved in culinary arts and cooking, they use wine to cook with because it gives a good smell. It has a good savor. Now, as I said, make it very clear that <coughs> they did not drink of it. Notice what it says. It says they poured it unto the Lord for a drink offering. So we can see that it, it makes perfect sense why it would be strong wine because it's a practical application. Verse number 8, notice that this is repeated again about the savor. Look at verse number 8. And the other lamb shalt thou offer at even, <coughs> as the meat offering of the morning, and as the drink offering thereof thou shalt offer it. So he's saying in the same way when you offer the evening, you got, it has a, a meat offering with it, and it has, it, it goes on to say it has a drink offering. It says, and, a, and as the drink offering thereof, thou shalt offer it a sacrifice made by fire. Watch this, of a sweet savor unto the Lord. So notice that it 
The drink, the purpose of the drink offering is to have a good smell. It causes it to smell good. It causes, it is, it, you know, the Lord talks about how he enjoys it and it's a good smell in his nostrils, it says in uh, the book of Numbers uh, elsewhere. So now I want you to flip over. Let's go to, uh, uh, actually stay here. Stay here. I want to read a couple of more verses. Look down at verse number 9. Let's go down here. There's a couple other things that are very important. And on the seventh day, two lambs of the first year without spot and two tenth deals of flour for a meat offering. So now, now we're talking about the offerings for the Sabbath day. Mingled with oil and the drink offering thereof. This is the burnt offering of every Sabbath beside the continual burnt offering and his drink offering. So notice that there's a continual burnt offering and it's offered with the continual meat offering and the continual drink offering. They're, also, they're always offered with or together. And it is, pour, it is offered with the lamb and it is poured out upon the fire where the lamb is burning. Verse number, uh, let's look at verse number 11. <coughs> and in the beginnings <coughs> of your months, ye you shall offer a burnt offering unto the Lord, two young bullocks and one ram, seven lambs of the first year without spot, and three-tenth deals of flour for a meat offering mingled with oil for one bullock, and two-tenth deals of flour for a meat offering mingled with oil for one ram, and a several-tenth deal of flour mingled with oil for a meat offering unto one lamb, for a burnt offering of a sweet savor, a sacrifice made by fire unto the Lord. So there it mentions the, the lamb being the burnt offering. It talks about you know offering the lamb, the ram, and the bullock. And they're all supposed to be offered. The event that's taking place right now is the beginning of months. The beginning of your months. So we, we went over the daily offering. We went over the Sabbath. Now we're looking at the beginning of months, right? <coughs> it's going over each of them. And notice they're all the same. Every single time, all three are offered or sacrificed together. Now look at verse 14 when it's talking about the drink offerings for the uh, beginning of month. It says, And their drink offerings shall be in half an in a hen of wine unto a bullock. So, shall be a half of an hen of wine unto a bullock, and the third part of an hen unto a ram, and a fourth part of an hen unto a lamb. This is the burnt offering of every month throughout the months of the year. So notice there it gives you different amounts of drink offerings. And if you had been paying attention when it talked about the flour, it did the exact same thing. Because there were three different types of offerings that they would offer in the beginning of months. A bullock. Which, what is a bullock? It'd be a cow, right? Exactly. It's a bull cow. That's what a bullock is. Then you have a ram, right? The ram is the male of the sheep. Then you have a lamb, which is a young or a baby or, or it, it, it's just a youth, let's say. It's a youth of the sheep, right? And obviously they're different sizes. If I had a cow, a bull cow standing here next to a ram, which one's going to be bigger? I mean, a bull cow is, you know, five times the size as a ram. Then if you had a lamb, which one's going to be, you know, the smallest of the three? It would be a lamb. Now, if you paid attention in order there, it went from largest to smallest. The bullock, the ram, and the lamb. And with each offering, it actually tells you there's, there's a different measurement or a different amount with each because they don't need the same amount. There would be a lot of drink offering that would be wasted if you poured the same amount upon the lamb that you poured out upon the bullock. I mean, think about how much space if we had a dead cow sitting right here, right? It would be huge, right? But now think about if we had a lamb sitting here. I mean, it's going to be like this big. So can you imagine if you took the same amount of wine that would be required for a bull and you poured that on a lamb? You just be like, keep pouring it. And it would be just wasted. It would be all over, running down. It wouldn't, it wouldn't, you know, it would be unnecessary, right? So if you look there, it says, uh, uh, <coughs> and their drink offering shall be half a hen of wine unto a bullock. So there's a half a hen of wine unto a bullock. And then it says, and the third part of a hen unto a ram. And a fourth part of a hen unto a Lamb. Now, you have a half of hen that goes to the bullock, uh, uh, and then you have basically a third, right? If you look, it says, and uh, a third part of an hen unto a ram, and then it says, and a fourth part unto the lamb. Now, if you look up what a hen is, one hen is equal to a gallon and a half in our U.S. measurement. That, so one hen, a full hen, is, you know, and this is H-I-N, this is their measurement that they used, uh, you know, for their, you know, liquids, right? 
a, a one hen is equal to a gallon and a half. And obviously we break our gallons into quarts. So in order to get like, you know, the third and the quarter and things like that, we'd have to break this into quarts. So what we would be doing is a bullock would have a half a gallon and a quart poured on it, or you could say three quarts. That's what a bullock would have poured on it. It would be three quarts or it would be, you know, a half a gallon and then one quart, right? Um, a ram would have two quarts poured on it. Right? That makes sense? And then a lamb would have a quart and a half poured on it. So if you know how much a quart and a half is, you go buy a quart, a quart of chocolate milk. It's kind of a larger, you know, little thing of, of like chocolate milk or milk, right? So it'd be a quart and a half. It's not a, it's about exactly what you would think that you would need to pour it on a lamb. Makes perfect sense. And then you gotta think for the, <coughs> For the bullock, you would have a half a gallon and a quart, or you could say three quarts. That's quite a bit more that you would pour on the bull, right? You wouldn't need that. That would not be necessary when it comes to like a little small lamb. Lambs are pretty small, like a, like a young lamb. If you think of sheep are not very big in general, but a lamb is, is pretty small. So that's the amounts that they would pour. Go to Numbers chapter number 15 while we're here in the book of Numbers. We're going to look this up in one other location here. Numbers chapter number 15. I'm going to give you a couple other interesting references to drink offerings that are offered. So there, that's the offerings that were offered actually in the, in the tabernacle and later in the temple. We have some references, some interesting references to drink offerings. Here's one in 2 Samuel chapter 23 verse 16. It says, And the three mighty men, these are David's mighty men, <coughs> break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. They were, they, were in, they were encompassed about or encamped and they weren't able to get out and David is yearning for you know the water of the well of Bethlehem which is his hometown. He's wanting that water and the three mighty men they break through and they go and they retrieve that water. This is David when he's in his old age and they bring it back to him and it says, Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. Obviously he desired that water very much. But notice that when it became <coughs> a drink offering in that situation, he poured it out. In that kind of situation, he, he sacrificed it unto the Lord as opposed to drinking it. And you remember he explains because, you know, the, 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 he's not going to drink the blood of these men. Because that's basically what they risk their lives to bring him water. And he's like, I'm not worth that. That's not worth it. I'll pour it unto the Lord and show the Lord how much I love him because I'm thirsty right now. And this would quench my thirst. Another interesting, and I don't know if you've noticed how this is worded, is 1 Samuel chapter 1 verse 13. This is when Hannah, you know, comes to Eli. And it says this, Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. That's the best thing you need to do with, you know, to make sure you don't get drunken, just put it away from you. Don't have it at all. Right? That's good advice. And then verse 15 says, And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink. But watch what she says, But have poured out my soul before the Lord. So that's how she uses that little, she's like almost using a reference or an analogy that you may not have noticed when you're, when you're reading over it. We use that language of pouring out your soul, but where do we get it from? What's it talking about, pouring out your soul? It's actually an analogy, and this comes up a few times if you want to look up, pour out your soul, you know, and things like that in the Bible. It's a reference to the drink offering that was poured out as a sacrifice. She's saying she, this is a sacrifice. It's like the fruit of our lips being sacrificed and giving thanksgiving in the New Testament. She's saying that she's giving a sacrifice. Instead of drinking of it, she's giving a sacrifice. She's not doing that. And she goes on to say, don't count thine handmaid as a daughter of Belial. You know, the type of people that drink alcohol and get drunk are Belial, children of Belial. That shows you how bad it is. So uh, she says, but she poured it out, and so she makes that reference to a drink offering, which is very interesting. Now here in Numbers chapter number 15, we're going to kind of read through this. It's somewhat repetitive of what we already read, but I wanted it to be exhaustive. I wanted it to be thorough. You can look over this also later. Look at Numbers chapter number 15. Look at verse number 1. <clears throat> and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye be come into the land of your habitations which I give unto you, <coughs> And will make an offering by fire unto the Lord. So this is any offering by fire, a burnt offering, <clears throat> or a sacrifice in performing a vow, or in free will offering, or in your solemn feast to make a sweet savor unto the Lord of the herd or of the flock. What did he just explain? Any and all offerings. That's what he's doing. He's trying to make sure that he includes every single one of them. Look at verse 4. Then shall he that offereth his offering unto the Lord bring a meat offering of a tenth deal of flour mingled with the fourth part of an hen of oil. You know what he just told you? So if you ever want to bring a sacrifice, if you ever want to bring a burnt offering of a lamb or a ram or anything like that that you're going to bring that's going to be burnt on the altar, 
It says, you also need to bring what? Then shall he that offereth his offering of the Lord bring a meat offering. So there always has to be a meat offering that is also offered with the burnt offering. Notice that. This is overlooked by a lot of people. Of a tenth deal of flour mingled with the fourth part of a hand of oil. And the fourth part of a hand of wine for a drink offering shalt thou prepare with the burnt offering or sacrifice for one lamb. So notice that it's prepared with it. Right? It's there with it. You need to bring all of it together. And if you want to bring a burnt offering, these two have to be offered as well. There's never a time when a burnt offering is offered without the meat offering and without the drink offering. It takes place every single time. Uh, and then it goes on. Or for a ram thou shalt prepare for a meat offering. Notice the difference here because the difference in size of the, the, the you know, the obviously the main portion of the offering is the burnt offering, which is the flesh. That is what pictures the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the purpose. And for a, <clears throat> a drink offering thou shalt offer the third part of an hen of wine for a sweet savor unto the Lord. And when thou preparest a bullock for a burnt offering or for a sacrifice and performing a vow or peace offerings unto the Lord, then shall he bring with a bullock a meat offering of three-tenth deal of flour mingled with half and hen of oil. And thou shalt bring for a drink offering half and hen of wine for an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. Then it goes over the lamb. It finishes every time with it being a sweet savor unto the Lord. So what are some of the things that we learned about the drink offering? I want you to go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy 14. <clears throat> We're going to conclude this portion of the sermon right here in Deuteronomy 14 of studying it and everything uh, and understanding the, the mechanics and the procedure. What all have we learned about the drink offering? There's, there's a few different types of offerings, but they're all offered together and at the same time. There's the burnt offering or the sacrifice of the animal, right? The animal sacrifice. That is always every time offered with the meat offering and the drink offering, right? There are different amounts that will be offered depending on whether you bring a bullock, a ram, or a lamb. There'll be a different amount of the flour to make the cake and the bread. There'll also be a different amount of the drink offering which is meant to be poured out. So it's poured out. Where does it take place? On the altar in the holy place. It has to be strong wine, so it has to be a high alcohol content. We know they're not drinking of it. It's very, very clear that they pour it out, that they pour this offering out and the priests are not allowed to drink of, of wine in the tabernacle because it's holy and alcohol is not holy in that sense and consuming it and if you drink of it, God says he'll kill you. So that shows you know, how bad it is to drink of alcohol. So. We learn all these different things about it. It's different types, it's different amounts, you know, depending upon that. Uh, it's poured out, it's not drank thereof. So we, we understand you know, pretty well the different mechanics of it. Now I want to go over something real quick, and I went over this a couple weeks ago, but I want to do it again, just because this is the passage that people will turn to to try to, you know, uh, uh, try to teach that you can drink alcohol. We're going to go over this quick, quickly, and then we're going to kind of change gears in the end of uh, the sermon. <clears throat> what is that saying, low battery? 10%. Yeah, my phone is jacked up. I need to get a new phone. So, Deuteronomy chapter number 14, look at verse number 22. Deuteronomy chapter number 14, verse number 22 talks about the tithe. Now we read about how they offered the tithe, but right here, this has a specific purpose in what it's speaking about. It says in Deuteronomy 14, 22, Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed, that the field bringeth forth year by year. And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God... <coughs> In the place which he shall choose to place his name there. Now that, of course, ended up being Jerusalem. So they had to go there and offer this offering there. The tithe of thy corn, of thy wine, and, and of thine oil, and the firstlings of thy herds, and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. And if the way be too long for thee, so that thou art not able to carry it. Or if the place be too far from thee, which the Lord thy God shall choose to set his name there, when the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, then shalt thou turn it into money, and bind up the money in thine hand, and shalt go unto the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. So just a quick explanation. What's going on here is God says you have to tithe all of your increase. Whatever it is, right? You have to tithe of the herd, of the flocks, the firstlings, the first fruits, everything of the field. You have to bring 10%, God says. And you need to bring it where God chooses to set his name. In this place, of course, the tabernacle, or in this case, the tabernacle was set up in Jerusalem. So 
they were mandated to bring their tithe to Jerusalem. They couldn't just offer it locally there wherever they were in Dan or, you know, maybe if they were way down in south in Beersheba, right? They had to offer it in Jerusalem. So some people are going to be further away from Jerusalem than others. But he says, hey, you need to bring it no matter what. And he's saying, and if it does so happen to be in your case where, you know, it is very far from, for you and logistically and practically it's not possible for you to bring it there, it's not physically practical, then what you can do is what he's explaining here. This is the whole purpose of the passage is you can take whatever you have and you can turn it into money. Saying you can take it and you can sell it to somebody and get the money's worth. You know, what's the equivalent when it comes to your local currency or gold or whatever they have? Then you take that money, that currency, and you go to Jerusalem. And then it says this, when you, when you get to Jerusalem, it says in verse number 26, <coughs> And thou shalt bestow, it means give, that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, for oxen or for sheep, or for wine or for strong drink, or for whatsoever thy soul desireth. And thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and shalt rejoice thou and thy household. Then it says in verse 27, And the Levite that is within thy gates, so the Levite that maybe lived in Beersheba, if they lived in Beersheba, because the Levites lived in the suburbs around each tribe. The Levite that is within thy gates, thou shalt not forsake him, for he hath no part nor inheritance with thee. Saying, you have to bring him with you when he comes, and he's going to offer this with you. And it says that they're going to offer this offering. Now, that what people will twist and they misunderstand is verse number 26 when it says, And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after. What does the word lust mean, number one? The, want, desire, right? Even the Bible uses the word covet. The Bible talks about coveting prayers, right? You know, there, this is all that this word means. We, people, for that reason, misunderstand it because when we use the word lust today, you know, it's normally used in a totally different uh, uh, context and with a different connotation. The Bible uses the word lust for just like desire or want. Whatever you want. That's what it means. So the whole purpose of the passage is for the person that when you're tithing, he's saying make sure that you tithe. Make sure that you bring it here to Jerusalem. You're not able to get out of this. Don't offer it where you're at. It has to come to Jerusalem. Okay, if it's too far, then you need to change it and turn it into money. This is the point of the passage. But then when you get back there to Jerusalem with your money, this is what he's answering. You don't have to get exactly what you had before. He mentions the tithe of your increase, the tithe of your field, the tithe of the flock and of the herds. He's saying when you get there, you can just purchase whatever you want. To do what with? Now let me make this very clear to make sure we're understanding the passage. What are they doing with it? Exactly. What is the tithe? There is a specific offering or sacrifice that takes place for the tithe. You tithe it. You take it and you tithe it and you give the offering and they sacrifice it. This is the sacrifice of the tithe. It's not just speaking about the tithe that's given to the Levites. It's the sacrifice of the tithe, the pastor of the tithe. Now another thing that throws people off about this is the fact that... <coughs> That the, uh, when it says at the end of the, of the verse, it says, And thou shalt rejoice, I'm sorry, it says, And thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice thou and thine household. They picture this as like a feast, because there's like a rejoicing that's taking place. When you are told to bring your sacrifice, numerous times in the book of Exodus, you are told to rejoice when you do it. Every time. It talks about the free will offering specifically in the book of Numbers even. It says to rejoice when you offer your offering. This is not people sitting down at a table and rejoicing and making merry like drinking and eating and making merry like the Bible says. That's not what's happening. Where is this offered? In the holy place. This is not a normal feast. It's almost even like the Passover, right? How the Passover, they stood there and all they had was a lamb, that's it. They didn't have a meat offering and a drink offering with that. That's not mentioned at all, that doesn't take place. The Passover, they stood with their shoes on, their, they had their, their belt on, they were girded up, right, around, about their loins. They had a rod in their hand and they're eating. This is not like a regular feast. It's not like they're eating and rejoicing in that sense and just like eating a bunch of food. That's not what's taking place. The purpose of this is an offering or a sacrifice. And when he says, whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, or whatsoever thy soul desireth, he's saying get whatever you want to offer. Get whatever you want to sacrifice. There's never a time where they drink of their tithe. There's never a time where they eat of their tithe in the situation when they take it in the sacrifice and the burnt offering. It's never mentioned one time. You never have a single mention of it ever. And not only that, and I said I was going to point this out to you, Exodus 29 
clearly, when speaking about the offering and the type of the offering that the tithe is given, it even gives us information in, in uh, Exodus chapter number 29 where we were reading earlier. It tells you very clearly that they eat of the lamb and of the meat, but it never mentions the drink offering. Why? Because they only bring a hen of a quarter of a hen. And what do they do with it? Thou shalt cause the wine to be poured out. They don't drink of it. The meat offering they eat of, which is the bread. The lamb they eat of, which is what? The flesh, right? Look at what it says in um, Exodus 29. I believe it's verse... Look at verse 31. <coughs> and thou shalt take the ram of the consecration and seize, seize his flesh in the holy place. And Aaron and his son shall eat the flesh of the ram and the bread that is in the basket by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And they shall eat those things wherewith the atonement was made to consecrate and to sanctify them, but a stranger shall not eat thereof because they are holy. Notice how it's repetitive in what they eat and what they consume and what they take in. What did they eat? They ate the lamb. They ate the ram, right? They ate the flesh. What else did they eat? The bread. And it says, and they shall eat those things. Uses that exact wording. Why isn't the drink offering mentioned? Why does it say, and they shall drink the drink offering? Why? Because they don't drink it. They pour it out. That's the purpose of the drink offering. They pour it out. Why was it alcoholic? Because it's flammable and because they get, what do they get from it? They get the flavors from it. The sweet savor. There's never a time ever in the Bible where they drink it. So if we want to know what's taking place in Deuteronomy 14, number one, read the context because it explains to you why it's saying whatsoever thy soul lusteth after. When you look at the list that's there in Deuteronomy 14:22. Or I'm sorry, 26. It says for oxen or for sheep or for wine or for strong drink. Do you know what it's mentioning? The things that they're allowed to offer. They can't just buy, could they buy a pig and offer that? No, of course not. They're allowed to offer these things. These are things that they're permitted to sacrifice. It's saying whatever you want to sacrifice, you can buy whatever you want to sacrifice. You don't have to get exactly what you want. So... That, there, so you see a, a few different misunderstandings and you, you can see why I chose to preach on the subject of the mechanics and the procedure of the drink offering because even passages like this, people have a vast misunderstanding because they don't understand how the offerings are offered. The drink offering is poured out every single time and that, that is what takes place with the drink offering. Now I want you to turn with me, you go ahead and you go to John chapter number 19 and I'm going to give you a couple of spiritual applications before we conclude uh, with the drink offering. Obviously we know that the sacrifices and everything that was given to you know, Moses and, and in Mount Sinai, that there were spiritual applications. There were foreshadowings and pictures of the things of the Old Testament. I'm going to give you two spiritual applications, both of them I believe to be very, very interesting. Uh, I'm going to give you them in reverse order. The first one I'm going to give you is going to be the secondary application. Then I'll give you the primary, what I believe the very obvious and clear primary application afterwards. Uh, the very first one is how they, they poured out the drink offering. They poured out the drink offering. Now why did they pour it out? What was the purpose of them pouring it out? Well, this was meant to picture, obviously, with the, with the lamb there, it meant, it's meant to picture the time of the death of Christ. When Christ was dying, and, and what is Jesus? He's the lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world, right? The lamb pictured the Lord Jesus Christ. So all of this, uh, you know, when, 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 when put together, they're just different components of the same event taking place of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see the lamb picturing the lamb being slain. We see the meat offering, which is what? Bread. What does Jesus you know, uh, uh, refer to himself as? Being the bread of life. That pictures the Lord Jesus Christ's flesh. And what would we say would picture you know, his blood? Well, of course, the drink offering being poured out. You know, wine, just in general, fermented or unfermented, is referred to as blood and symbolizes blood many different times in the Bible. Now I'm going to show you that this almost exact thing of, of his blood being poured out took place when he died on the cross. Uh, we'll see these different events taking place. Look at John chapter number 19 verse number 33. It says, But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. Now I want you to notice the first thing that was mentioned was that they didn't break his legs. Do you know what they didn't do to the lamb? And they were told that they must not do it or they weren't allowed to offer it? Break the bone. It couldn't have a, a bone broken. What was the purpose of that? 
Exactly. It was prophetic of what was going to actually happen. Now, if maybe Jesus would have had in a real event, like one of his legs broken or something broken, then they would have said, hey, break just the right leg. So it's just reflecting what was actually going to happen later. So they said, hey, the lamb, don't break any of its legs. Why? Because Jesus, when he died, he died before. He died earlier because they beat him to a bloody pulp, I'm sure, than the other two guys. So when they came around, they broke both their legs. When it breaks your legs, it causes your diaphragm to collapse. And then you suffocate to death with your lungs being you know, uh, 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 suffocated or you know, being enclosed in there. That's how they kill them quicker. Well, when Jesus, when they came over to break his legs, the guy's like, this guy's already dead. Then they made a proof to see and to make sure that the guy was dead. They took a spear and they shoved the spear into his side. And you know what happened? It poured out. Water just shed and, and just poured out. And you know what else came out? Blood. You know what color it was? Even if you mix water with blood, it, it would be red. Right? So what this pictured was, it pictured the Lord Jesus Christ's blood being poured out or being shed for us. Now I want to make this point because you know people would say, well, I, th I thought that you know his blood was the pure blood of the grape. We could see that clearly being taught in Deuteronomy, right? So why would it be pictured by something that's you know you know alcoholic or poison? I want you to go over to John chapter number three, verse number fourteen. I'll tell you why. Because at the moment that Jesus Christ died on the cross, he was our substitution. You know what he he, he pictured was your blood. You know what he pictured was your sinful state. When he died on that cross, you know, obviously he, was, he lived the righteous life, but what do we always explain? When he gets to the point of, of, of that death, when he's taking upon that death, what, what happens? He bore our sins in his body. God laid upon him all of our sins. That's the reason why he was going through that. It was like I was dying on that cross because I'm sinful and I don't, I, I don't deserve eternal life, everlasting life. I'm not righteous. He was righteous. But there was a trade-off that took place where he all of a sudden is my substitute. And now when he's on that cross, you know what he is? He's, he's, he's dying in the place of a sinful man. He has the sins of the whole world laid upon him. Isaiah 53, 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let me ask you this. Why, did, why does the Bible talk about uh, 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 Jesus says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why is that? Because he had laid upon him the sins of the whole world. He had the sins, all of the sins of the whole world upon him. Now what's even more interesting is this. John 3.14 says this. Jesus speaking. And as, as Moses, and, as, and as Moses excuse me, lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So he says, even so, like saying in the same way, as Moses lifted up in the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. You know what he just did? He used that serpent that Moses lifted up as a type of what? Of himself dying on the cross. Do you notice that? He used that as a type or as a picture of himself. Now, is a serpent something good? No, it's something very bad. You know, the devil is likened unto being a serpent. It's something very evil and wicked and sinful, isn't it? Why would he liken himself unto a serpent being lifted up on the cross? Why? What typifies evil and sin? The devil. You know what he did? He bore the sins of the whole body in his flesh and on his flesh. He was dying in our place at that time. So it makes perfect sense why they would liken it unto what? Unto an alcoholic beverage being poured out. Right? Do you know what an alcoholic beverage is even referred to as? The cruel venom of asps. You know what an asp is? It's a serpent or a snake. Why? Because it's harmful. You know why? Because sin's harmful. And what, what was going on with Christ was very harmful. That was the, the punishments of living a sinful life is you'll have your sins poured out and also we see Him bearing our sins and taking our punishment. That's what sinful nature deserves. And you know what you have is you have the, the, the symbolism of, his, of, his, of our sins in His body and Him taking our punishment with the alcohol being poured out. Even in Proverbs chapter number 23, we have it likened unto, it says, talking about alcohol, it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. What? Like the venom. In, in Deuteronomy, it says the cruel venom of, of uh, uh, how's it worded? Uh, the, the, the venom of asp, the poison of dragons and cruel venom of asp. That's what it says. The venom of dragons is the cruel venom of asp. So it's that sin, like leaven, is likened unto something that's, uh, that's in alcohol here, and it's poisonous, and it's bad. So that's why it's because he was bearing our sins in his body. And you know what? When it comes to actually taking Christ, on Christ's righteousness, you know what it's represented by? New wine. The pure blood of the grape. 
And something else I thought of when it comes to the alcohol subject, kind of uh, opposite than this, or, or, or outside of this a little bit, parenthetic to this, is this. You know, it makes sense that in the <coughs> holy place they weren't allowed to drink any alcohol or they'd die. What does that represent? And the holiest of all represent? Heaven, the kingdom of God. And, it and what does Christ say we're going to drink there? New wine in the kingdom, right? Showing that, hey, you know, the priests weren't allowed to drink any alcohol because the high priest didn't drink any alcohol. And when we get to heaven, he's not going to be drinking any alcohol. We're going to be drinking new wine, which is the pure blood of the grape. So that's the first application, and that's not even, even close to being the primary application. That's the secondary application, and not the clearest application. So the second point is this. I want you to go to <coughs> um, Psalm 75. Psalm chapter number 75. I'm just about finished. Psalm chapter number 75. <clears throat> Another thing in the Bible that is typified by alcohol and, and uh, by you know, fermented wine is God's wrath. God's wrath is, uh, is symbolized by alcohol. Why? Because alcohol is bad and it brings judgment. It brings punishments upon you. If you drink out, look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it moveth itself aright, you know, uh, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. Why? At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an owl. You should stay away from it because if you take thereof, you drink thereof, you will wreck your life. There are punishments and bad things that happen to you. You should just stay away from it. So it makes perfect sense that God would liken His wrath, bad things happening unto you, and woes and curses unto an alcoholic beverage, doesn't it? It's a perfect parallel. It's a perfect parallel. It, notice that it's, it, 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 it wouldn't make sense if it's just like, oh, the Bible says you can drink in moderation. Well, why don't you drink His wrath in moderation? Why don't you just take a sip of it? It doesn't make sense. No, He just likens it unto the cup in general. Because if you drink of it at all, it's bad. Because alcohol is bad. Because it causes problems and it hurts you. Right? So his, his but his, uh, his, the cup in his hand is likened unto, it's right, likened unto a beverage. And it's specifically, as I said, an alcoholic beverage. I want you to look at Psalm chapter number 75, verse number 8. Psalm chapter number 75, verse number 8 says this. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup. Now watch this. And the wine is red. It is full of mixture, and he poureth out of the same, but the dregs thereof, and all the wicked of the earth shall wring them out and drink them. I want you to notice that when he talks about the cup that's in his hand, what does it say? It says, and it is red. Why does it need to tell you that? Think about that. Why does it need to say, and it is red? What is he trying to tell you? It's alcohol. Does that ring a bell? Proverbs 23? It says, look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. Notice that there's a wine that's red and a wine that's not red. And you can look at the wine that's not red, but you shouldn't look at the wine that is red. But right now, when it talks about the wrath of God, what's it likened unto? Red wine or alcohol. Do you notice that? God's wrath is likened unto alcohol all throughout the Bible. I'm going to give you a few examples. Jeremiah 25, 15 says, For thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me, Take the wine cup of this fury at my hand, and cause all the nations to whom I, <coughs> I send thee to drink it. And they shall drink and be moved and be mad because of the sword that will send among them that I will send among them. Isaiah 51, 17, Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, which hast drunk at the hand of the Lord of the cup of his fury. Thou hast drunk in the dregs of the cup of trembling and wrung them out. Thus saith the Lord, thy Lord, the Lord and thy God, that pleadeth the cause of, the, of his people. Behold, excuse me, I have taken out of thine hand the cup of trembling, even the dregs of the cup of my fury. Thou shalt no more drink it again. Lamentations 4.21 Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, that dwellest in the land of Uz. The cup also shall pass through unto thee. Thou shalt be drunken and shalt make thyself naked. Habakkuk 2.16 Thou art filled with the shame for glory. Drink thou also and let thy foreskin be uncovered. The cup of the Lord's right hand shall be turned unto thee and shameful spewing shall be on thy glory. Over and over again, it talks about the cup that's in the, the hand's Lord. The cup of the Lord's right hand. He's got a, a cup in his hand, and it's red. It's alcoholic, and it's bad. And when he pours it out on you, it, what does it represent? It's God's wrath being poured out on you. I want you to notice that. And uh, not only that, I don't know if you ever thought about this, but <coughs> the vials in the book of Revelation. What is he pouring out when he's got a vial? What's a vial? It's a container that has a juice in it. 
And then in the book of Revelation, after he's pouring out his wrath, he mentions something randomly, but he doesn't necessarily connect the two. It says in Revelation 14, 9, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his, in his image and, the, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture, and in the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. That's talking about the vials. It's talking about them being punished. And then furthermore, notice how it talks about them in hell being burned and that that is a part of <coughs> the wrath of God. Revelation 16, 19 also talks about the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So that's what that all represents. Now, who is the Lamb of God? If we look at the offerings, who is the Lamb of God? Right? Jesus Christ. We look at all the sacrifices and the offerings and we had to pick one that was in, in, a, in the core sense representing the Lord Jesus Christ. Which is it? It's the Lamb. Because he said in John 1.29, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. He was that Lamb that was being punished for what? Why was he slain? He's being killed for us. He was taking our punishment. You know what punishment that we deserve is the wrath of God. You know what he had on him was the wrath of God. What is God's wrath represented by? By a red cup. You know what's represented by in Revelation 14? It says it's poured out without mixture. Strong wine. You know what they did when they walked into that tabernacle? They killed that lamb. They slit its throat and killed it. They chopped it up the way they were supposed to. They put it on the altar. You saw their fire being related to the wrath of God. But then they took in a cup that's red. And it was without mixture. You know what they did? Was they poured it on the lamb. Do you know what that's meant to represent? He's taking the wrath of God for me and for you. He was taking the punishment of all of mankind. So you say, why was it alcoholic? Because God's wrath is likened to alcohol because it's not something good. And then they poured it out on top of him. And he was taking the wrath of God for us. So you, you study these, you know, you think, oh, the drink offering is not that interesting. It's super interesting. Yeah. And you, you study the Bible, and, and, and not only that, you, you, these things are avoided, and it causes problems for people when they don't actually understand, hey, it's not, it's not something that you drink. It's something that's poured out. And without the understanding of the mechanics and how this actually took place as far as the procedure... You wouldn't have understood all of these different types and symbols that are in the Bible there for you and to grow off of, right? Now we're ending in Philippians chapter number 2. We're going to end right now. Philippians chapter number 2. I want to give you an application for yourself and for me, a good application to end with. And, and keep in mind what I just said, how without the understanding of how the offerings and the sacrifices took place, there are things in the Bible that, that you will not understand. The Bible is a very deep book. You know, <coughs> the world without... <coughs> Being saved and having the Spirit of God in them without ever, you know, then reading it, even Christians without reading it. You know, they may think, oh man, the Bible's a boring book. You know, there's nothing really in there. The Bible's an amazingly deep, deep book. And it proves to be written by, you know, the hand of God. You know, guiding the men that wrote it down over and over and over again the more that I study and the more that I learn. Yeah. Once you look at Philippians chapter number 2, verse number 16, it says this, Holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. What's he talking about the day of Christ? Day of judgment. The day when he comes back, right? Uh, it says this, and, rejoice, and he says, that I, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Now look at verse 17. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. I want you to look at verse number 17 a little bit closer. You may have read over this many times. But notice what he says. Yea, and if I be offered, watch this, upon the sacrifice and service of your faith. Notice how what he's referring to is an offering. And then he says it's offered, watch this, upon the sacrifice. What's he talking about? What in the Old Testament sacrificial system was referred to as an offering every single time? The drink offering. And you know what they did with the drink offering? It was the only thing that was offered upon something. And you know what it was offered upon? The sacrifice. You know what Paul is very subtly, and the Holy Spirit is very subtly, you know, kind of throwing a bone to there and, and making a reference to there? How the drink offering was offered upon the sacrifice in the Old Testament. And without the understanding of how the drink offering actually took place and that it was offered on the sacrifice and on the lamb... You know, you have a little truth here that you would never really truly understand. You would read right over it. You'd blow right over your head. 
So he's clearly making a reference to the drink offering being offered upon their sacrifice. And what we can learn from this is this. On the day of Christ, you know, he's talking about when Christ comes back. He's talking about his works being tried. And when he comes back, you know, he talks about, you know, behold, I come quickly, my reward is with me. Right? To give to every man according as his work shall be. He's talking about his works and how he's going to be rewarded from the Lord. And a lot of times in our lives, personally, when we think about how we're going to be rewarded, what do we measure it by? How much soul winning am I doing? How much prayer am I doing? How, how much am I reading my Bible? We measure it upon our own personal growth. You know, one theme that is ignored by many, many people in the Bible is that a lot of times your rewards are based upon how well you're helping other people. That's very, very often. He calls, Paul calls other people, other churches, his crown in, in, uh, elsewhere. And a lot of times when we think about how God is going to reward us and how Christ is going to reward us, we think about our own personal growth. But you know, one thing that we ignore a lot is how... We are a drink offering, if you will, that's poured out upon other people's sacrifice. And what, is, what was the purpose of the drink offering? It was added in addition to the burning sacrifice already. What was the purpose? It was to help the sacrifice smell better. It was to further or benefit the sacrifice that we were poured out upon. They were the main course. And sometimes we just focus about our own, on our own Christianity all the time. And we fit, forget about everybody else's Christianity. But that's something that you're going to be judged by when you stand before Christ. And one of the things you'll receive rewards for and receive crowns for is how well you were able to further other people's Christianity. And what Paul's referencing here, and the reason why it's important, is he's like the drink offering poured out upon their sacrifices and the work that they do. And the service of their faith. And you know, what you can do as being that drink offering, what does the drink offering do to it? It makes it smell a little better to God. Think about that. It causes it to have a little bit more of a sweet savor. Don't you want your Christian, even just in a, in a selfless sense of loving your brethren, don't you want your other brothers and sisters in here to do better for God and to further their Christianity? Don't you want other brothers and sisters that you can think, in, in, think about in here, you know, and other even brothers and sisters in other churches, when they stand before God and you have to watch that, don't you want them to <coughs> do well and to receive rewards and God to be pleased with them? You're going to be judged based on that with the opportunities that you have. You're going to be offered also based upon how they did. Don't you want them to smell good to God and have a good sweet savor? Because that's what the wine, the drink offering, adds when it's offered upon the sacrifice. It helps them smell better to God. You know what else it does? Is it's flammable. Think about that. Do you know what that represents here? And There's deep things in here. You can study this and see what Paul's getting at. What did it cause when they took the drink offering and they poured it out on the fire? It ignited the fire. Do you know what you can do? You know, <clears throat> one of the things that, that the, where zeal comes from in a church is collectiveness. That is where zeal comes from in a church. That is for sure what causes people, what causes one person to be zealous is another person zealous. And what causes you know, the other person to be zealous is vice versa. So you're working off of each other. I'm working off of you. And obviously the leader stands up and I can preach as zealous as can possibly be. But the, the church, there's more of you than there is of me. And what will ignite someone else's fire is your fire. And what will ignite somebody, you know, the other person's fire is yours. You know what you need to be, be is you need to be the drink offering that's poured out on somebody else's sacrifice. You need to try to further another brother or sister's Christianity and get them to do more for God because God's going to judge you based on that. You can get rewards for how well you helped other brothers and sisters in their Christian growth. So we can't be obsessed with our own Christian growth all the time. We need to also care about and think about our other brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, we could try to ignite that fire even more so or again for other brothers and sisters in Christ. We could try to be the drink offering that helps them smell a little bit better in the nostrils of God. And he's, he, he loves and desires that sweet savor. So when we look at rewards, when we look at you know, uh, 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 the, the, the day of Christ, don't just focus on and think about how God's just going to judge you because it's not just going to be based on how you did in your own Christian life. It's also going to be based on how you were able to benefit other people. And that's all the drink offering did. It was just like a side note, kind of. That takes humility. It was just like an additive. You know what the main course was? The sacrifice. But if each and every person in here considered everybody else as being the main sacrifice and the main course, it would benefit each and every other person. Each person in here, you know what we should strive to be? The drink offering. That's offered upon the sacrifice. That ignites other people's zeal. That 
ignites their fire and causes their fire to burn more and longer and also that causes them to smell better in the nostrils of God. When you, when you, uh, I'll end on this last note. When you study things in the Bible, a lot of times you're like, oh, the drink offering, you know, that can't be that interesting. Never heard anything about it. All the Bible's deep. Walk away with that. All the Bible's deep. All the Bible is interesting and cool, and that's why you're supposed to study the Bible. And you can learn things from every aspect. So never look at something that you're like, mail the drink offering. That's not interesting. The whole Bible is interesting, and there's depths of knowledge and wisdom hidden in every single you know, uh, aspect of it. So we need to first, of course, focus on understanding the mechanics of it, what that means, and then we can move on from there of the applications and seeing what it represents and how we can further understand these things. Study out the stuff that maybe doesn't seem interesting, because you're missing symbolism that is contingent upon whether you understand actually what the drink offering or whatever we're discussing is. Because you couldn't understand these truths without it. Be a drink offering unto your brother and sister in Christ. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. We love you, dear Lord. We thank you for everything you've done for us, Heavenly Father. We ask you to bless our church, bless everyone in it. Uh, just help us to be a drink offering that's poured out, dear Lord, and, and to uh, ignite the flame in, in our other brothers and sisters in Christ, and that we would care about them, and, and uh, everyone would, would esteem other better than himself. We love you so much. We ask you that you would bless this day, bless the soul winning that's going to take place, bless our church as a whole, help us to grow, help us all individually to grow and to strengthen ourselves and other people. We love you so much, and be with us. And in Jesus Christ's name,